So, Pat, you've had a lifelong interest in how body, posture, movement can influence well-being. God, yes, that's true. You know, the first time I remember uh, noticing my body consciously was when I was seven years old. My mother had me take modern dance class because she knew I was going to be really tall. And she said, if you're going to be tall, you're going to be graceful. So she put me in this dance class. And uh, Mrs. Bays, my teacher, was trying to teach us all to really align our bodies in that poise that dancers have. And I just got it. I, 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 was, I, I felt different, and I could feel it. Um, and that really made an impression on me. I was seven or eight years old, and I felt that alignment in my body and that space, that length in my body. And as a child growing up in the country in Indiana, my body was my main go-to when I was stressed. Physical activity, climbing trees, running through the forest, swimming in the lake. Those were my regulators mm -hmm. that calmed me down as a child. So I, I just became interested in how the body contributes to, to well-being. It was expanded further in the 70s when I, I started teaching yoga and dance in, in, at Vanderbilt Psychiatric Hospital. And patients seemed to get better, especially the ones who did the yoga class. Maybe they were going to get better anyway, but that piqued my interest further on how we can use our own movement and body to enhance our psychological health. So, so from the beginning, it was something that was an experiential learning of it. Uh, mm -hmm. as, a, as a kid, you were showing the, how it feels better, how, you know, so it's really an experiential thing as opposed to, to an idea. That's right. I, I feel like my body is, is my best laboratory for learning. And now, you know, there's research that supports some of these ideas. Amy Cuddy from Harvard has done some wonderful research showing that if we stand in a tall, aligned posture and take up space with our bodies, our testosterone goes up and our cortisol goes down. And we know that testosterone gives us confidence. Um, it helps us be assertive. It helps us feel like we have some empowerment in the world. And cortisol is a, a stress hormone that is increased when we're feeling anxious, when we have trauma. So I thought that was very interesting, because mm -hmm. what I thought as a seven-year-old, she is now proven through her research. And she, she also showed the opposite, that if we keep ourselves small or hunch over or don't have nice aligned posture, our testosterone will go down and our cortisol will go up. So it's, it, isn't it fascinating that it's not just an idea, it's proven by science. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so, so, you know, that shrinking mm -hmm. and expanding, taking space. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So that it really makes me uh, hope that listeners will start maybe paying attention to lengthening their bodies, like reaching for the sky when you're walking down the street so that your body actually lengthens and taking up space, expanding your breath so your chest cavity becomes fuller and you take up more space because it's, it's shown that that will enhance mm -hmm. our... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I'm noticing as we're talking and I'm listening to you and I'm listening to your words and I'm also listening to your body language and I'm noticing that as you talk, you're actually lengthening, taking space, expanding in a gentle way, not in a in a in a abrupt way. Uh, and I'm noticing that it makes my body also want to follow that, um, yes. and um, and experience it as well. Yes, I think uh, you're alluding to the the idea of mirror neurons that. 
Galize and others, just some Italian researchers, discovered that if we, if I take on a certain posture, you're likely to automatically mirror my posture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so if I were sitting here like this, your body would probably start to go more like this. Yeah, right? yeah. And this is one of the ways we learn how to live in our bodies is by our parents and other children when we're very small. You know, we tend to copy their mirror, their posture. But it's mm -hmm. not, don't think about it, it just happens by itself. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, at the very least, as we're talking right now, um, what you're doing is you're embodying this mm -hmm. piece of experience, this piece of transmission of experience. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Yeah. yeah, that idea of embodying is very critical, I think, because we can embody different attitudes, different feelings. So if, if we're feeling angry, we might tense up like this, and our jaw might get tense, and our, you know, our, our muscles might tighten up. And if we're embodying a fear state, we might, it's a different kind of tightening. We might pull in and pull away and, you know, shrink into ourselves. It's also been shown by another researcher, Nina Bull, that if she did a study with uh, students at Columbia and found that if they embodied certain postures, practice those postures, that even when they stop practicing those postures, the emotion that was associated with that posture tended to be more available to them. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if somebody practiced this angry this posture, even when they stopped practicing it, anger was more available. Mm -hmm. So that's also very interesting, uh, how we do embody different emotional states, different psychological beliefs even, yeah, so um, what you're talking about is expanding the range of our experience. Um, that if we have a default mode, a go-to posture, which tends to be shrunken or which tends to be angry, or, uh, you know, practicing different postures opens actually the field of our experience. Yes, I think that's very true. I think about movement vocabulary, you know, how, how we move, how we live in our bodies. Can, uh, can, it can be an expansive vocabulary where we have a lot of different gestures and postures and movements available to us, or it, but it can also be very restrictive. Mm -hmm. And during these movement habits, you know, growing up over, over our whole lifetime of experience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We're not aware of how, how much they influence us and how much they influence the quality of our relationships, you know, how we treat our children, etc. So, so, in a way, coming back to what you said at the beginning of our conversation, that being trained uh, as a dancer, as a kid, um, opened you up um, to something that you might have gone by uh, and not notice. And, yes. um, and so that... Uh, um, when we're talking about now is a sense of curiosity about what can be and about uh, exploring that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that curiosity was really uh, influenced by Ron Kurtz, who was my most important mentor. He was also my best friend. He passed away in 2011. But I met Ron in the early 70s, and he uh, was very interested in how people's bodies and the way they walked and the way they moved influenced the, the quality of their lives. And he and I used to go down to the mall here in Boulder, Colorado, and just watch people and sensitize ourselves to all the different ways that people moved. And it was fascinating uh, to do this kind of what we call body reading. Mm -hmm. Because you see all the different patterns and once you, once you start to, to look at bodies and how they move, you start to make the, the associations. You can tell when somebody's not feeling good in themselves. You can tell when somebody's upset or when they're angry or frustrated. You can see it in their bodies. Mm -hmm. We pick that up unconsciously anyway. 
But when, when we start to really look, um, it's a different kind of learning because it becomes more conscious than what we're picking up automatically. Yeah, and, and I think what you were talking about is not just looking at bodies um, as you would look at ants or um, animals, but there was also that resonance inside so that you have the um, inner experience of what it might feel like to be in that position. That's right. And that, that picks up on the mirror neuron mm -hmm. a little bit because even as you watch somebody move, even if you don't know them, you start to feel what they're feeling. Your body will start to constrict or your chin will go up or whatever posture they have, your body will automatically uh, do that. And we have, human beings have a tremendous capacity for resonance with others. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, so um, that watching, that people watching there, um, is is essentially a way to be more aware of the human experience um, and seeing the variety of it and seeing how it can resonate inside. I think that that's true, and it, it's it's the best education I ever had about the body is just mm -hmm. observation, and it's free. You don't have to pay <laughs> thousands of dollars to get your degree to learn about the body. It's completely free, yeah. and it, it's fun to go with a friend. Ron and I used to do this down to the mall, and we would walk at a, at a big distance behind people so they didn't know what we were doing. We would just take on their walk, and however they were moving, we would move like they did, you know, and, and that gave us so much information because our experience inside ourselves would immediately change when we embodied somebody else's embodiment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so if anything, um, this is kind of an encouragement for people to try it for themselves. You know, mm -hmm. not as an exercise in mimicking people for the sake of mimicking, but just in terms of expanding. Um, yes, to expanding your awareness, because see, through that... Uh, those little experiments and observations, I would learn about my own body. Mm -hmm. Like, I would learn things like, oh, this is really familiar. Like, I remember uh, uh, one woman that I was, that I observed, she had her chin up a little bit like this. And I immediately recognized it. Like, if I'm confronted, I'll get, I can get a little, I can get defensive, and my chin can go up. Which really, that's off-putting, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I am talking during the whole interview like this. It's very off-putting, but I didn't know that. Mm. I didn't know my chin went up. Um, Albert Einstein is credited with that saying, the fish will be the last to discover water. And I feel like we're the last to know about our bodies because mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a like the clothes we never take off. The way we move and live in our bodies is always there. So... Uh, um, you need to find ways to, to learn about it. And, and observing others and taking on their, their movements and posture was a great way for me to learn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because at this point, it's not just um, the default mode that you're noticing, but you notice the, the possibilities of other ways of being. That's right. And then yeah. it allows you to notice that what you're doing is not necessarily the only way and put it in context. Yes, that's right. And and then you can start to shift and see that can change relationships. Like mm -hmm. like if I'm in with a friend or my partner or my kids, you know, and I react to something they're saying with my head up, we're immediately in a certain kind of dynamic. Mm -hmm. But if I inhibit that, once I become aware of it I have a choice. Then I can I'll notice I'll, I'll notice, oh, my chin's going up, I want to bring it down. And then the relationship changes right away. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it can be a great tool to just en enhance your relationships when you learn about the nonverbal communication in your own body. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. A lot of, there's a lot of research about that most of our communication actually happens nonverbally, um, and that we we key off of that with each other even more than we do the words. Yeah, yeah. So, so as you pay attention, as we pay attention to our body, then um, it becomes less abstract, 
uh, and instead of just, um, in a way, going through coding what's happening through some kind of intellectual concept, uh, we have a more immediate sense of how the, uh, you know, the psychological and the and the body movement are intertwined, and we can shift it at that level. Yes, that that's right. And I, I think what you said, that it's not a coding, it's not an intellectual exercise, it's really an experiential exercise in your own body. So you, you feel it. You know? like, like, you feel very differently. If I, like, if I'm in this posture, mm-hmm, doing this mm-hmm. energy, everything changes. My relationship changes. I start to feel a little, a little nervous and scared. Mm-hmm. You know? Uh, and that our whole relationship shifts, and and then if I'm in this posture, my breathing expands. You know, I feel much more connected with you. I don't feel frightened. So our bodies can really um, influence our emotions. And so what I'm noticing, and you know, as you were just a minute ago doing this little example, and you stayed here. And you stayed here not just a, a fraction of a second to demonstrate it, but you stayed here longer. And then you were describing, I notice, uh, and then you were describing what you know, were noticing. And, um, and then when you shifted, you again were describing what was happening. So uh, the staying with it, the, what you're talking about, the paying attention you're talking about, really involves staying with as opposed to just the conceptual, oh, I reach that position, I immediately shift. Yeah. There's a staying, there's a paying attention to, uh, there's a comparing to what the other position is in order to really get information. Mm-hmm. I think that's right. I, if I just do it like this and then stop doing it, it doesn't give me a chance to feel its effect. Mm-hmm. And this is where mindfulness comes in. Mindfulness is such a buzzword these days. Mm -hmm. Mindfulness really means that we're paying attention to our internal experience, uh, our internal landscape, our feelings, our thoughts, our our body postures, our body sensation and movement. So when you do a little experiment, like, like change your posture in any way, you know, then you can take a little time and be mindful. Like, my voice changes right away. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, My voice gets a little more aggressive and a little bit tighter. And so, isn't that interesting? So, yeah. you can you can use mindfulness. So many people are you know, proficient with mindfulness now to give a little time when you're taking a posture and notice how it changes your, your internal experience. It's interesting because, of course, there are probably as many definitions of mindfulness as there are people talking about it. But as you're describing it this way, there is an emphasis on the experiment part. So it's not mindfulness in order to reach, say, a certain rarefied status or a certain state of serenity, but is about, you know, that desire through curiosity um, to find out more. And that's a very active form of mindfulness. Mm-hmm. Well, it is active, and I, I feel like that's another free education because mindfulness, through mindfulness, you learn, and you learn about yourself if you're aware. So if we think of ex- little experiments, like anything can be a little experiment, like your, you know, your wife or your husband walks into the room. How does your body change? If you tighten up, that's something to look at. Mm-hmm. If you expand and you have the impulse to move forward, you know that's that's something else. So no, you can learn about yourself and your part in your relationships uh, through this mindful awareness. And it is different. It's, we're not trying to get to any rarefied state. We're, we're trying to learn about how we organize ourselves in the face of certain ch- maybe challenges mm-hmm. or joys. Yeah, and so. Again, how we organize ourselves um, is I uh, want to stay there a little longer because it's, a, it's in a way a sense of how we respond to other situations, how we respond to other people. We're not living in isolation. Uh, we're living in connection, in relationships, 
And uh, what we're talking about here is that paying attention to the body and actually playing with different ways in which we can, you know, change our body reaction is a way to get attuned to the different ways in which our whole organism responds to situations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think that's I think that's accurate because how we organize our internal experience is going to influence our interaction with the environment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like if my, oh, so I, wanna, I wanted to just highlight, uh, you know, double underline the phrase you use, you know, how we organize our internal experience. Mm -hmm. And so in lots of ways, this is what you've been talking about. And uh, in, a, in a way that's very down to earth, it's very simple, you know, simply paying attention to your body, paying attention to other people's body. But you're talking about organizing our internal experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I am, and the the body is the one thing that is easy to shift once you're aware of it. So, and, and then that will change your internal organization. So, if I'm having an argument with my partner, for example, and uh, I start tightening up and I start my jaw gets tight and I do that little chin lift, okay, that fight. I can guarantee is going to escalate. You can you can hear how it influences my voice, my movement. You can't see my hand, but my hand's going like this, you right. know. Uh, and and so if I because that's not what I would want with with my partner, right? Yeah. So if I can just have the same argument and relax my shoulders, take a breath, and change my body, the argument's going to have a different trajectory. Mm -hmm. It just is, period. And and often, you know, people will say, because I am a psychotherapist, they'll come in and say, you know, we just keep getting into fights, and I don't know why. And I know why. It's because of of how their body is predicting how they're going to, you know, it's organizing their experience in a certain way that brings up certain emotions, certain ways of talking that is going to escalate an argument. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's a, a very simple way to illustrate the, the finding people, you know, seem to always bring with themselves, um, you know, the, the same drama. And yes. this is a way in which we replicate it by, by taking on that organization that then, you know, helps others respond in the way we're trying to avoid. That's right. Yeah. That's exactly right. I think of that old saying, you know, Mark Twain would say, life is one damn thing after another. Yeah. Well, well, what I wanted to what I wanted to say about that, Edna St. Vincent Millay would say, it's life isn't one damn thing after another. It's the same damn thing over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> and I think about that with our life challenges, you know. And if if we could learn to embody a different way of being in the face of those challenges, it wouldn't be the same damn thing over and over again because right. it would shift. It would shift the, whatever the dynamic is. You know, Amy Cuddy um, found this out too in her research with posture. She did uh, an, a, a, a research experiment where um, there, people were being interviewed for jobs and they were they either took on this nice aligned posture. Now notice this aligned posture isn't an aggressive posture. Yeah. yeah. It's aligned, taking up space. So half the group took up that and half the two group took up a a posture like this. Mm -hmm. Guess which group got hired? Yes. <laughs> sat like this. So it it really affects in a very practical way um the the your life experience. So, you know, um, the uh, cliche of um, thinking out of the box, um, essentially what you're trying to, you know, one of the, the things you're illustrating is um, we can live inside the box our whole lives, uh, the box that is our default posture. Um, and a very simple way to think of what it means to think out of the box is to actually change that box and change that posture and then the world starts responding differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a nice uh, analogy. 
to, uh, to compare it with thinking outside the box because it's true. Mm -hmm. And if we change, you know, our our movement and our posture, um, we will have a, we will have a different response. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's so, true. so in lots of ways, um, you know, therapy is about the possibility of making changes, and. Um, um, and so what you're describing at a very down-to-earth way is how people can find a way, how we can all find ways uh, to make changes in our lives by enlisting that curiosity, that spirit of experimenting, um, yeah. and, and starting practicing in small ways, apparently, uh, to live differently. Yes, I think so. And, you know... I think this really speaks to the, the dichotomy of what Alan, Alan Shore, who's a, a good friend and a great neuroscientist, he, he talks about the explicit self, meaning who we think we are and how we think we're coming across. But then there's the implicit self that we're not conscious of, we're not aware of. And the body can really help us become aware of that implicit part of ourselves. Um, and Alan, in his research, he says, we think that we're, um, we know, you know, how we're behaving, what we're doing, and that we're, our lives are thought out, et cetera. But he said, really, it's the implicit part of ourselves that is driving our behavior. And, and for me, then, when you, you talk about therapy, it's discovering and befriending that implicit self that the body can really help us with. Yeah. And this yeah. Is, see, this is true of the arguments. Like, like when, when I do couples therapy, couples always come in with content arguments. Like, you know, he's always gone. Or she doesn't, you know, she's not emotionally available. That's what they think the argument is about. But I, when I watch their bodies... It's the communication, this body-to-body -body communication that is fueling the argument. It's never the content. And that's why the same thing keeps happening over and over, because the implicit body-to-body -body conversation they're having, that's what's driving the content. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The other way around. Mm -hmm. So I think that a, it's a very profound uh, statement. To It's the implicit that's driving... The, the argument, uh, you know, the old, uh, the medium is the message, uh, mm -hmm. that, you know, in a way, a sense of who are we, um, and uh, we tend to think of ourselves in terms of the content, in terms of the logic, but mm -hmm. what this is bringing us back to, you know, at the beginning in terms of paying attention to our body, in terms of noticing what happens in arguments, uh, that actually a lot of who we are is driven by this implicit. That's right. That's right. And so both from a practical point of view, but also from a sense of deeply knowing who we are, uh, we're talking about reconnecting to the implicit and our you know, underlying nature. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, through, through the body. Yeah. I think, you know, this really gets back to early child development because you know, when we're born, we really have to learn how to live in our bodies. Like you see little babies are squirming in there. You know, they're moving. Their moving's not directional. They're, they're like, you can almost see them starting to inhabit the body, find out what does it mean to have a body. But then as, as we grow, our body's movement and even its posture and its structure is shaped around how we're treated by the people who take care of us. So, for example, um, John Bowlby, who's considered the father of attachment, he, he wrote a lot and talked a lot about proximity-seeking actions, like how we seek proximity with others. Do we reach out? You know, can we reach out? Um, can we reach for another person or for their hand? Like children, you know, um, need to reach for their attachment figures, the people who care for them in order to survive. But if you take a child who's um, care, 
caregiver was abusive or neglected them or didn't respond to them when they naturally reached out for care, that child's going to stop reaching out in a full, open-hearted way. Because we learn. That's conditioning. We learn. If we reach out and we get hit, or we get somebody turns away from us, we're not going to stop reaching out. So those habits that we learn in response to how we're cared for long before we can, long, long before we have language, they really influence and cons- can constrain our, our future capacity in relationship. Yeah. So, yeah. And, so, yeah. And, and that's the implicit self. That's, that's the implicit. And if we think about the brain, you know, the, for when a baby's born, the right brain, which is all about feelings and the body processing and all that, that part of the brain is online. But the left part, the cognitive part, has to develop. So when Alan Shore talks about the implicit self, he's really talking about the right brain. It's not the conscious part of our brain. But yet it's so powerful in terms of determining our well-being and our behavior. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, with that example about children and how we're treated as children and wanting to reach forward and be willing and able to do that versus, you know, reflexively not being able to do it. Uh, you know, it's a, it's something that uh, is exists before verbal knowledge of it or logical knowledge of it is. And so, um, you know, the rest is just added, you know, layers. That's right. But yeah. is not, you know, the basic uh, building block of who we are. Yeah. Right, and the rest of that that's added later. I mean, I don't want to say that it can't change. Mm-hmm. Maybe, you know, maybe our parents were really stressed out when we were born, or they didn't have enough money, or you know, they couldn't attend to us the way that we needed. But that can change over time when attachment behavior, when the parent changes, also. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's not. It, I don't want people. To get the idea that it's cut in stone, it will it will change with further experience. Mm-hmm. So, so the, the image that comes to mind as you're talking is, in a way, uh, if you're trying to just uh, uh, imagine, say that your life, one's life, is a movie, and uh, if we're trying to understand it better and change it by simply reading the script we have much less of a power of making changes that if we, you know, for instance, it's a ballet, it's a dance, and we follow the movement of it, uh, and the movement in a way captures more of that uh, implicit quality and what's in-depth change. Um, and that's that's kind of where, you know, your example leads me, uh, uh-huh. and the role of movement. Uh-huh. Of finding that that implicit movement in your life. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, I think that's true. And we think about when we think about the movement of the body. There's so many. We have so much capacity for, for different kinds of movement, you know. And um, Bonnie Brainbridge Cohen, who's not a therapist, but she's a, a movement specialist. She talked about five different kinds of movements that are available even to fetuses in the womb that then we develop over a lifetime, and reaching is one. Mm-hmm. Reaching is one, but pushing is another. Pushing mm-hmm. away. Um, um, and many people, especially if they've had early childhood relational trauma, like sexual abuse, um, have not embodied that action because it, it couldn't possibly be effective mm-hmm. when, in, when you're a child in the face of that abuse. You can't push away your aggressor. So that action then gets truncated. Mm-hmm. And later in life, that person might have trouble being assertive because this action is foreign to them. So when we look at movement vocabulary, we really consider so many different movements. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. So, as maybe a way to um, 
encapsulate, in a way, find a, a conclusion to what we've been talking about. Um, is it fair to say that maybe what you're encouraging people to do is to have that curiosity and spirit of experimentation mm-hmm. about movement? Yes, I think so. And I, the, the curiosity uh, really doesn't include judgment, you know? Mm-hmm. And that's what we have learned so many negative things about our bodies. You know, we, we've been so shamed about our physical appearance, our, our bodies, the way we look, etc. And so the exploration of the body has to have that kind of generosity where you, if you're looking at movement or studying your own movement, which is easier to do if you do it in front of a mirror, because we, it's hard to get in, it's hard to really know what we're doing unless we see ourselves, right? Mm-hmm. Or video yourself. But if you're studying your own movement, I'd like people to be able to embody that compassion and that non judgmental attitude and the, the recognition that whatever movement patterns you have were learned in response as the best response to a certain environment. Like if, if, if you have trouble making this gesture of reaching out with an open-hearted way, maybe you reach out with your hand down and stiff and maybe you pull back, that is because of the, the way you were treated as a child. Um, because every child, first instinct is to reach out in an open-hearted way, but if it's not met with in response with love, um, it, would be, it wouldn't be wise for the child to continue that movement. So when you see your body's posture or movement, if, it's best to, to, to not judge it. And, and, and to make, you might get in touch with why you have that posture. Like my chin going up, I had that, that posture. I know exactly why. Because I, that was the only way to fight back with my very um, aggressive older brother. Mm-hmm. So I don't know why I have that, but my older brother isn't isn't a part of my life here in Boulder. You know, he lives far away, but yet that habit is still there. Mm-hmm. But, but that habit served me well as a child with the, with the brother I have. So we need to recognize how our patterns served us well in the past, but maybe limit our quality of life now. So we might want to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's an excellent point about how when we pay attention to our pattern, we might discover something that we just then are ashamed of or judgmental of, and um, and the need to go through that hurdle by again engaging curiosity and say, well, yeah, it may be disturbing, but you know, actually, why did it come about? And it had a reason for coming about, and then going further. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, and that you know that encompasses a, the attitude of, of you know that I think we're all doing the best that we can always. And, um, so if we can embody that and 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 use our experimentation with our bodies to discover that kind of internal intelligence, I think it can be a great learning and a great gift. Thanks, Pat. You're welcome. This is part of the Active Pause podcast at activepause.com.